much. Hey, Les. How you doing? I'm doing great. Welcome to an episode of Black Boomer Besties from Brooklyn. Brooklyn. <laughs> we are the channel for women who grew up at a time when there were so many rules about how to live a good life. And we want to give you permission to push against those rules because we want you to have joy and we want you to have it abundantly. So if that sounds like it's you, are we talking to you? We'd <laughs> love you to subscribe to our channel and press like and tell your friends about us. We think you'll enjoy it. So, and let me tell you what I wanted to talk to you about today. Go for it. I was looking at a uh, YouTube video and I subscribed to this doctor's channel. It's called Medical Secrets. Um, the doctor that runs it or speaks about it is Dr. Anthony Covey. Now, I'm a medical professional. I'm a physician. I'm an anesthesiologist, a board certified anesthesiologist, and I've been in practice over 20 years. Um, and some of the things that made me uh, think I thought about during, uh, while looking at medical secrets made me say, hmm, wait a minute. It's not exactly what happens in the operating rooms. So I wanted to make this video um, and just let people know actually about three things that I'm going to tell them about. First of all, what actually happens in uh, operating rooms. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, fears that patients have and how they may navigate and get around those fears, or at least communicate them to their physician. And three, I want to just show you how you can advocate for yourself in an operating um, room setting. Yeah. Before I go on, though, I do want to say that I'm not offering medical advice to anyone individually, and I'm speaking in generalities. And if you do have any specific questions about your medical care, I want you to seek medical attention and speak to your doctors personally. Got that? <laughs> Got it. <laughs> Got it. So medical secrets, there was an episode, apparently this um, doctor is an anesthesiologist, ding, 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 it rang my, um, it made me bristle. And he's an integrative medicine specialist. And his video talked about loneliness and how that presents itself under anesthesia. So my spidey sense went up and I'm like, huh? <laughs> apparently as a patient was getting ready to go to sleep, the doctor asked him, oh, how are you going to do after your surgery? And he noticed that the patient seemed depressed. So in this video, Ange, he stopped the surgery, took the mask off the patient's face, didn't put him to sleep and started saying, well, let's explore your mood and your loneliness and this. And I'm like, this doesn't happen. What kind of fiction is this? First of all, in an operating room, whether it's in a hospital or a surgery center or wherever, it's, it's a very controlled and timed setting. We have cases that typically start at 7.30 in the morning. And if they run hourly or every two hours or whatever, they go back to back. And often when a certain um, surgery team, let's say orthopedics, finish their surgeries at noon, then there's another block of surgeries that go from 12 to 1 or 1 to 2 or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I was just thinking of the logistics involved with this anesthesiologist stopping the surgery to have a psychological consult with a patient, it doesn't happen. It would cause a delay in the whole day's um, cases. The surgeons would be looking at you like, when is the patient going to sleep holding up their scalpels? I'm kidding. But, <laughs> but this doctor also said that he asked the whole staff, meaning scrub techs, they're scrubbed and they're sterile, nurses, 
surgeons to step out of the room so he could have a private conversation with a patient. I got to tell you that never happens. I've never seen it. And I don't know what type of medicine or practice he runs, but mm, mm. sounded a little suspicious. Um, but what really does happen is that I and people like me, anesthesiologists, are trained with four years of medical school, four to five years of training after medical school to be your eyes and ears when you're asleep in the operating room. Mm. That's, That's a perspective that I never really considered, that you are the eyes and ears of the patient, patient. who is under anesthesia. That's incredible. Sometimes I've I've joked to my colleagues and said, you know what, it's me. I am the only one who is between that surgeon mm. and that patient. Mm. And it is my role in the operating room. And I tell patients when they come in a little tentative or fearful, every single time your heart beats, I'm there to hear it. Wow. Every single time you take a breath, I'm there to see it. Wow. You're such a and physician. and and while I may be doing something, the room and the monitors, standard monitors are set up such that we have sounds coming from that we should be hearing. So if you hear a silent operating room, you never hear an, a silent operating room, not if there's a patient on the table. Mm -hmm. So my back could be turned and I could be drawing up medication or what have you. But if I hear a certain tone on the monitor, it may prompt me to turn around or not turn right. around, right, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, so there is a standard way that we monitor every patient, blood pressure regularly, breathing regularly, um, how much they breathe, how deeply they're breathing, mm -hmm. things like that, right? Mm -hmm. So I have, um, I've had patients say, well, what if I stop breathing or what <laughs> if I, this, you know, and I don't want to laugh and make light of it because their fears are real, sure. but that's the reason I'm there. Let me just give you an example. Patients come in with fears that a very fearful patient can be very dangerous. I'll tell you mm -hmm. about a case that happened to me today. Mm -hmm. A patient came in for a procedure. He was having a um, shockwave lithotripsy because he had kidney stones. Okay. And I was you know told- that's, that was Greek, right? Is that right? Oh, you know, the where they are sound. <laughs> I'm like, really? Was that do I <laughs> thought you were going to say it was started by the Greeks. In that procedure. No. Oh, my God. That is lost in translation for real. I'm like, medicine is Latin. No, okay, that's a Greek-initiated no, no. procedure. I thought you were talking Listen, about the history of medicine. Break it down. Break it down for us, please. Break so it down. So what I mean is the patient had kidney stones. Okay. And there is a procedure to break up the stones actually yeah. using so sound waves ah, got right it. Okay. so it it, it, it. goes through the skin mm -hmm. and it um uses these sound waves to break them into small pieces so the patient right. can pass them later right, so anyway right. this patient we it's kind of painful mm -hmm. it's always done under iv sedation where i'm monitoring the patient and giving them medication to make them sleep mm -hmm. um it's almost like um, when you pull a rubber band and pop the skin over and over, they get 3,000 shocks. Mm -hmm. So oh, that's if like you when can my imagine. Ankle, that's like when I got shockwave therapy on my right, ankle. Right, right. It's right. So it was if painful. You, yeah. If you can imagine every time they take a, um, a, a shock, a yeah. patient may jump or wince or whatever. So they're asleep so that they're comfortable. This right. patient did not want anesthesia. And wow. why he was afraid that he would not wake up Okay. And he said, people have told him that mm -hmm. anesthesia is dangerous. Wow. So obviously it entailed me having this 
conversation with him mm -hmm. ahead of time. I said, you know, sometimes it's pretty dangerous. He suffered from anxiety to begin with, but okay. I said, sometimes it's not the right thing to speak to other people. I said, you know, I've been, I've seen thousands and thousands of patients. Mm -hmm. So the stories that I tell you might be a little more accurate than mm -hmm. anecdotal stories of people on the street. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As it turns out, I did end up um, putting him to sleep. Okay. But it was a circuitous way where he initially wanted me to come into the operating room with him to see mm. if he can tolerate it. Then mm. if he can't tolerate it, give him this, but don't give him this or what okay. have you. Wow. And it turned into this complicated scenario where mm. eventually he did fine, mm -hmm. um, ended up going to sleep allowing me to put him to sleep eventually, but here's why I wanted to bring it up in this case. Yeah. And, and I want you this. to talk to about, okay, what, how does that mesh with him advocating for himself? If you could mention that. That, too. okay. I like that question. Mm -hmm. I have been practicing enough that there are certain procedures that are pretty routine to me. Mm -hmm taking out your, your, when your gallbladder comes out or doing a colonoscopy mm -hmm. or doing sedation for um, sinus surgery or what have you, right? If a patient comes in with an un, what I deem an unusual request, mm -hmm. what it does is it sets up for increased problems. I see. What okay. you want is you want things to, you do not want any deviation from a standard yes. or a normal right. way. Right. When patients come in and shaking fear and anxiety, it really creates an atmosphere of tension in the whole operating room between mm -hmm. the whole staff. Mm -hmm. What happened with this particular patient because of his anxiety and the pain of the procedure before he allowed me to put his, him to sleep is that his mm -hmm. blood pressure actually responded to his anxiety oh, and was wow. 220 over 110. Oh my gosh. And because wow. he did not ask me to, or in, specifically asked me not to intervene, yeah. I almost had to watch his blood pressure that's a dangerous blood pressure. Eventually, wow. before I even put him to sleep, I had to treat his blood pressure. Now he's oh. a blood pressure patient. Right. Oh, wow. wow. So had this person allowed me to treat him in the way that I would have in a safe manner, I would mm -hmm. have. Mm -hmm. He would not have had that episode of hypertension, high blood yeah. pressure. I yeah. would not have had to give him an extra medication to treat the blood pressure. Mm -hmm. And I would have sedated him and made sure he was comfortable as I do with all of my patients. Got it. Got so it. how does that differ with a person who advocates for himself? I love the fact that he spoke up and talked to me about his concerns. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But when we go to a provider whom we trust, mm -hmm who we schedule a procedure and say, I'm in your hands, doctor. I think that's where it needs to stop. I see, okay. I am well aware of patients who have had a history of nausea after procedures or increased anxiety or whatever. I can treat those things. Yeah. But when you tell me that don't put me to sleep for a procedure where you should be asleep. Yeah, yeah. Now I have to treat the not just the psychological hand holding, but now the physiological changes that come with fear and anxiety, the mm -hmm. blood pressure, the mm -hmm. increased cortisol and this mm -hmm. and that and what have you. Mm -hmm. And that's when things can get dangerous. Got it. You know, I'm thinking about the way that, um, the way that racism shows up in medicine, you know, um, because you're speaking from a, this is what I would do. This is who I am. This mm -hmm. is the way I treat people. Mm -hmm. um, and there are many doctors who don't. And so can you speak a little bit to maybe they did have a 
not a not necessarily that anesthesia um, the them receiving anesthesia made something happen but they have some fears about physicians they don't trust like you're asking them to do mm -hmm. because they have um there are many reasons let's choose one because their race has been a factor in them getting poor care mm -hmm. at some point before what can they do about that it's legitimate do you know what i mean so how it can is. they yeah. it is but we don't have the luxury of taking ourselves out of the medical community. We don't have the luxury of staying at home and never getting a colonoscopy. Okay. Um, okay. Say more about that. Like we don't have, we need to get medical care. I see. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. We need to get medical care. Right. right. And in that case, what I would advocate for is finding provider medical providers whom you trust, Mm. and who has the qualities that are important to you. Okay. Um, there's more than enough gastroenterologists that if you don't like this particular person to get your colonoscopy from, find another one. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. I've told mm -hmm. friends and loved ones, if you don't find um, a psychotherapist that seems to speak your language and understand mm -hmm. your cultural needs, mm -hmm. then you can find another one. Got it. Okay. So I think that by time you get to the surgeon and are about to have surgery, you've already gotten through the initial um, barrier of mm -hmm. this is somebody I'm, to whom I would put my life in their hands. Got I it. trust enough for that step. Yeah. I think it would be awful to go mm -hmm. to someone for whom you have fears and I'm not so sure and what right. have you. Right. Um, I think it depends on where you are in the country, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and the coastal on the East coast and West coast, you have a little bit more choice in that regard, mm -hmm. but I don't think that there's, um, a scarcity of physicians that you can find somebody for whom you shouldn't go in with shaking fear. Right. Got it. Okay. Because that is creating more danger for you. I think it, when you ask people who do things routinely to mm -hmm. step out of their routine and make special accommodations, I think it gets riskier. I see. Got it. You know, okay. and I asked this person to trust me enough that you can leave out of here with a different narrative on your own. Mm -hmm. You know, Ultimately, yeah. I don't think he could. He actually just allowed me to put him to sleep because he couldn't tolerate the discomfort. Right, right. You know, it wasn't like, you know. Okay, but, Doc. Yeah, it was... yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. I get it. I get exactly. It. <laughs> it's, like the, uncle, um, uncle. it's like the ladies in labor for whom I, uh, when I give them epidurals for their mm -hmm. labor pain, you know, we have this thing called informed consent. Yeah. So um, you're supposed to explain the procedure, the risks and the benefits, and then the people are supposed to make a decision as to mm -hmm. do you want this procedure or not. And it's informed consent is in every surgical procedure or anesthetic right. care or whatever. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when women are in pain, it's like, you know, that pain is a big motivator. If I went in there and said, listen, I'm going to take away your pain, but... Um, <laughs> you may not survive this. And, um, you know, your baby may come out barking like a dog Stop. Stop and, it. you know, and this, and they're like, yeah, 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 just do it, just do it. Just do it. You know, it's <laughs> like, there seems to be a little bit of conversion. <laughs> I mean, coercion, a little coercion there, you know. Wow, wow. and conversion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> From a human to an animal, to yeah. a barnyard animal. <laughs> but um but I I like the fact that you did um mention the difference between um speaking up perhaps inappropriately and advocating yeah. for yourself because yeah. I love the fact that I offer patients that we're a collaborative team. Right. 
Right. And so often I've heard patients say to me, you know, no one has ever explained to me what yeah. happens, yeah. Um, what yeah. what they're going to do in there. Because when right. people see an anesthesiologist, what they think about anesthesia is that they're awake one minute and then yes. they go into this black box and they have yes. no idea what happens. And right. sometimes right. I find it comforting to them to let them know ac actually what will happen when they're in that black box what's yeah. actually going yeah. on patients don't realize all the time that i am there in the room with them i love every that. second i love that that do you know changed. how many people have asked me when i'm asleep do you just step out wow they don't know you know yeah wow the way that you framed it that i am there to um to advocate for you when you are oh yeah under, that that oh, is yeah that's that's it right there because you've had experiences with anesthesiologists and they were awful awful so you, i had to awful. write when i had my uh donated my kidney i hated my anesthesiologist yeah. i did not tell him in advance that i was an anesthesiologist and right. he just kind of blew me off like i was some idiot mm -hmm. you're gonna go to sleep mm -hmm. and then you're gonna wake up and i'm wow. thinking to myself i know it's gonna be more than that <laughs> And only when I was about to go to sleep in the OR did the other staff and the surgeons tell him she's an anesthesiologist, she's a physician, and he's like, "Oh, you didn't tell me. Why, why do why I need should to? You have to. Why yeah. do I need to? Wow, interesting, right? Mm-hmm. Bum. I expect that you guys are going to have some comments about what I've yes. said, some questions Please. about what I've said, and Please. I love to answer questions and see comments. And if you appreciate the things that I'm telling you, and or if you've learned something, why don't you subscribe to us and like, like our page? Because we got so much more information to give we you that's so juicy, just more. like this. Juicy, juicy, juicy. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Yeah, we appreciate Bye now. Bye.